Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In the second of a pair of podcasts to mark the centenary of the armistice, signed on the 11th of November 1918, we hear from novelist Sebastian Folkes, author of Birdsong. I'm Sebastian Folkes, I'm a novelist, and I'm here in St Andrews to talk about the memories of war. What I'm interested in is what happened and whether a lot of people know and understand what happened. The last four years in this country, the success of a lot of the First World War commemorations has really been in information, making up the educational deficit. The Department of Culture, Media and Sport can give you a lot of tables and polls showing how basic knowledge of what took place between 1418 has massively increased. The public events funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, 1418 Now, artistic events, the BBC's output, combined with what the government has done in terms of public commemorations and services, and what people have done spontaneously, albeit encouraged by the government, in their local villages, towns, churches, and so on, has definitely meant there's been a big lift in people's knowledge and understanding of events. Before we can get to the academic questions of collective memory and how things are remembered and how they should be remembered in what way and for how long, you first of all have to establish what people are prepared to know and to understand. Rule one is you can't let politicians anywhere near it because politicians have an agenda and always top of their agenda is to be re-elected. But they also sometimes will tell lies in a good cause. The classic example of this is in France which after the liberation in 1944 was on the verge of civil war because the majority of France had backed the Germans and Pétain and Vichy. And only after it became clear that the tide of war was changing did they begin to think that there might be something to be said for the Allied side. To begin with, they had put together the British and Americans and the Jews as the hate figures and the Bolsheviks. All of these were their enemies. This changed very, very rapidly in the last year, and even more so in the weeks and months following the liberation in 1944. General de Gaulle, who had not really been successful in attracting many people to London to come and join him, sold to the French people a story. And the story was that they had liberated themselves, la France résistante, by the force of their own arms. There was, in fact, one French division involved in the D-Day landings in Normandy, a free French division. And Eisenhower had to be persuaded by Churchill to allow General de Gaulle to walk down the Shores Elysees because Eisenhower was of the opinion that France had been liberated by the Americans and the Canadians and the British in that order, which was correct. But de Gaulle was a clever politician, and he knew that some continuity had to be established with the past of France as a self-respecting country, and not just as a self-respecting democratic country, but as the leader of the world. And you have to understand that France sees itself as the pinnacle of world civilization, not just any country. So de Gaulle had to sell France this story, and they, by and large, bought into it. In some places, the milice, the militia of the Vichy government, were put on trial very quickly in kangaroo courts and executed. In other places, they were given new uniforms and became the riot police of de Gaulle's subsequent government. Then you have the Algerian War, which happens not long afterwards, which, after a massive amount of bloodletting, the French lose, and they grant Algeria full independence. A large number of Algerians who had supported the French occupiers were tortured, killed. Some of them were brought over to France where they were put in concentration camps in France. And a large number of pieds noirs, which is to say French settlers in Algeria who'd run the country as colonial administrators, came home and were completely ignored by the government. Even as de Gaulle was saying, we must give full independence to Algeria, this is the way the war is going, this is the practical thing to do. People said, but so much blood has been spilt, to which he replied, nothing dries quicker than blood meaning this will be forgotten. But the truth is it hasn't really been forgotten. And the difficulties faced in modern day Paris and France, in the banlieue and in Islamic fundamentalism, different in kind from those faced in this country, 
which are essentially the outcome of a sort of death cult of extreme religious fundamentalists. What's happened in France and Paris is a long-held grievance from the people of North Africa, Muslims of North African descent, former French colonies. It's a continuation of the Algerian war because they have a lot to feel grievance about, not least the fact that Maurice Pepin, who was found guilty of crimes against humanity for rounding up the Jews for the French government during the Second World War, the Velodrome d'Hiver, was also, as prefect of police in Paris, responsible for rounding up Algerians and murdering them and throwing them into the Seine. So there is a long, long history of grievance here. You would say that the people of the Maghreb, the men and women of Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, haven't been able to establish what they are trying to remember. The whole story of what happened in occupied France didn't begin to be told until the 1990s. So you have the first apology or acknowledgement by President Chirac 50 years later and a rather half-hearted monument on the River Seine near the Velodrome d'Hiver, which was taken down because nobody wanted this unpleasant reminder. There is one cattle truck at Drancy, which was the holding camp in the northern suburbs. There's the Charles de Gaulle Esplanade and a bit of breast beating about how splendid the resistance was, but again, 50 years late. Although, of course, books have been published, there is a tremendous level of ignorance about what happened. And if you go to Drancy now, you see immigrants sitting around this half-heartedly finished public housing block. You can be perfectly certain that none of them really know what took place. They see a cattle truck and a stretch of railway line at the end of this large quadrangle. But does it mean anything to them? And if so, what? So then this does actually raise questions of whether we should remember and what the difference is between commemorating, as we would see in full solemnity, the horrific losses at, for instance, the Battle of the Somme, 1916, and then the perpetuation of a grievance. When the last caliph was asked to leave Istanbul by Kemal Ataturk in 1922, was put on a train to Switzerland, it was a very unremarkable event. However, nearly 100 years later, one man remembered it when he ordered two airliners to be flown into the Twin Towers. Osama bin Laden made reference to this, the end, the last inexcusable humiliation of the caliphate. Likewise, the Serbians, as they were murdering Bosnian Muslims, were invoking the Battle of Kosovo Polje, which they'd lost in 1380-something, and the fall of Constantinople in 1450-something. We would say, this is a long time ago. But one man's grudge is another man's commemoration, and this is where it does become complicated. The First World War was very, very well memorialized in the years that followed. Think of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which still has these wonderful cemeteries in all the battlefields in all the countries of the world where this took place. And you think of the great Lutyens Memorial at Tietval on the Somme, Remembrance Day and so on. But I do think the experience of the First World War fell out of public awareness during the 70s and 80s, partly because of the Vietnam War and that generation, my generation, I suppose, are abhorrence of all violence and all war, but also because of the way that the Second World War was so very well commemorated, particularly the Holocaust, by Jewish people worldwide. What we've tried to do, I say we, because I'm part of a government advisory group, is to be non-political. I think that it has been successful largely in terms of education. Hundreds and thousands of children have been to the battlefields and now know a great deal more about what went on. I think it's very important that in the big ceremonial public occasions, like the commemoration of the Battle of Jutland, there was a degree of reconciliation between Germany and the Allies. There may be a bit more in November this year. I hope and believe there might be. It's also very important, I think, to get into the public services context and history of what really happened. For instance, the Battle of the Somme, I wrote the connective tissue of the service, tried very hard between the readings to set in perspective where this battle came in the war, where it stood in relation to Verdun, where it stood in relation to what was going to happen in Flanders, and so on. It is very difficult to get that historical context in, but we've tried. The commemoration of the role played by women during the war, both as nurses and civilians on the home front and working in factories, the way in which that's been commemorated with marches of women's tapestries and so on has caught a mood. 
I compare that with the way that the death of Harry Patch was marked about 10 years ago. And he, if you remember, was the last surviving Tommy. He was given honorary degrees from at least two, maybe three universities. Radiohead, the group, wrote a song for him. The Prince of Wales went to his funeral. And this was a man who'd actually served for three months in 1917 as a Lewis gunner, hated every moment of it, and believed the war was a complete and utter waste of time. The fuss that was made, it just showed to me a very bad conscience. This country had awoken too late to the fact that for too long it had not paid sufficient respect and understanding to the experiences of these people. I do think that the commemorations that have taken place publicly, privately, in villages, communities, towns, in the last four years have been much more rational and much better informed, although by no means perfect, as well as getting the factual and educational level up. There has also been a redemptive quality to this. This is another interesting aspect of remembrance. Redemption, of course, is a very Christian concept, but a lot of Christian concepts have been absorbed by Western society well outside the spiritual realm of the church itself. The vigil and the commemorative service attended by thousands of descendants of people who'd fought at the Somme. It was an atmosphere of near chaos because there were so many different government departments on both sides of the channel. Also, it was 48 hours after Brexit, so relations between the two countries were very poor. President Hollande said he wasn't going to come to the service and his speech had to be given to the French Prime Minister, but at the last minute he changed his mind, he did come. Throughout all this political coming and going and all this turbulence and confusion, I, in my mind, had all the time the thought of a 19-year-old kid from, it might be Glasgow, Edinburgh, Belfast, London, anywhere, who had been there, not knowing on earth what was going to happen. And then having endured July the 1st and having seen two-thirds of his battalion annihilated, went to lie down that night and thought, what does this mean? And will anyone ever understand? And who put us into this? How did this appalling catastrophe come about? And how am I supposed to live the rest of my life? I think the fact that we had the Duke of Cambridge, Prince Charles, prime ministers, presidents, senior army people from all countries there, bowing their heads in respect, and penance, really, was a great moment. Of course, it means nothing to the men who are dead, and it means nothing to the children and the grandchildren that they never had. But it was something, and there was an element of redemption there, I think. What happens now in the way that we think about or remember, I have problems with the word remember just on a pedantic level because we're not remembering the First World War because we weren't there. We are thinking about it or commemorating it, perhaps. Things have changed in the light of the last four years. I think we will need to find new ways of commemorating it and thinking about it, new symbolic ways. Though there is life in the old symbols. After all, one of the great artistic events of the last four years was the ceramic poppies in the moat of the Tower of London, which then moved around the country. And that was a new way of using an old symbol. So I'm not saying that we should leave these tried and trusted symbols to one side. But I think we should find new ways of remembering. One way that has come up is the installation of a walk on the Western Front from the Channel right through Belgium, Flanders, the Somme uplands, down towards Verdun and down towards Switzerland. That will be a voie sacrée, a sort of holy way, like the stages of the cross, really. I think that's a really good idea. And it's quite a doable walk, too. It's not such an extraordinary distance as long as it's tastefully done. And the French are pretty good about this. They've had their own way of memorializing Verdun, especially for a long time. The memory of the First World War, the way we thought about it, has to carry on for two or three years because the Treaty of Versailles and what that meant and how that led inexorably to the Second World War is also very much part of the story. The effects of the war didn't end on the 11th of November 1918. Pretty soon, there will be a new committee or body thinking about the commemoration of the Second World War. I think it's generally agreed that Britain got round to thinking about the First World War very late. Other countries have started planning their commemorations about five years ahead of it, and we got round to it about one year before it began. 
similar problems will face the commemoration of the Second World War because we have told ourselves a story about it which is not that accurate, I think. I would be the last person to play down British achievements in that war which were truly heroic through all six years. But the figures on the Eastern Front of casualties, deaths and civilian deaths of Russia in particular, they do tell a different story. These stories are not mutually exclusive. The need to educate and simply to inform will again be one of the most important things. And then after that, we can get into ways of commemorating. My new book, Paris Echo, does deal a bit with the question of how much history you need to know and whether knowing a lot and understanding a lot means you necessarily live a better life. The question of commemoration is touched on in this little snatch of conversation between two characters. The narrator is an American historical researcher. They're talking about the fact that during the Second World War, German counterintelligence set up its headquarters in the Avenue Foch. They chose that street particularly because it was Foch who'd taken the German surrender in 1918. That's quite a grudge, remarks my character. It's just that I was thinking, we talk so much about the importance of remembering, of redeeming the lives of people who have gone before, of educating children so they don't make the same mistakes. What if that's all just pious nonsense? What do you mean? Well, what really is the difference between the commemoration of an atrocity and the perpetuation of a grievance? Julian breathed in. I think we know. Don't just dismiss the question. I'm not. Only a few years ago, the Serbs were massacring Bosnian Muslims to get their own back for the way the Serbs were beaten by the Ottoman Turks at the Battle of Kosovo in 1380-something. The whole Serbian identity is built on the myth of kosovo Polje. Wouldn't it be better if they'd just forgotten? 600 years is a bloody long time to brood. Sure is. I was beginning to feel a little worn down, but Julian carried on. What happened to the Anzac forces at Gallipoli in 1915 was the making of Australia. The anniversary became their national day, but it also preserved a feeling of anger against their British commanders. It made resentment a key part of who they are, though Britain lost twice as many men as Australia and New Zealand. France actually lost more as well. There in slightly playful novelistic dialogue you have in simple terms some of the issues we've been talking about. That was novelist Sebastian Folkes. You have been listening to The British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn.